Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and Horror. Today we are going to explore the secrets of Moorland, a haunted land filled with ancient curses and supernatural mysteries. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this video will focus on the Moorland from the classic Ravenloft setting and will consider the events and characters that existed in the domain prior to the Van Richten Guide to Ravenloft reboot. At the end of my coverage of Morden from the classic Ravenloft setting, I will make some considerations and comparisons with the new version of Morden in Van Richten Guide to Ravenloft. Are you ready? In search of a cure for the curse of lycanthropy, we travel to Morden to find possible allies. In Mordenshire, we discover that a renowned monster hunter, Dr. Rudolf von Richten, has been missing for some years, and our travels also reveal no clue about the presence of the wise priestesses of Hala. Finding no allies, we research ancient records of the history of Mordent, and discover that some descendants of the lost Godfrey bloodline possess a great sensitivity to the spirit world and are capable of contacting spirits. Perhaps, if we access the knowledge from the spirits of the dead, we can learn more about Dr. Rudolf von Richten's fate and uncover whether the natural werewolf that infected us still lives. We search for the medium known as Michael Jandalis, who meets us at his home for a seance. We get around the table in front of a Ouija board and ask questions to the dead. Soon, a tension seems to fill the room, and supernatural presence begins to whisper to us, not just what we ask of them, but countless dark secrets of Mordant. Power of Raven Morden seems to be a peaceful and quiet region, forgotten by time, where its inhabitants go about their daily routines without great aspirations or surprises. However, this region exudes ancient curses and secrets, and the restless spirits that haunt these lands have much to tell about the horrors of this cursed domain. One of the oldest legends about the region of Morden tells of a powerful and macabre artifact the Pipe of Mordent. In the distant past, a minstrel named Stewart arrived in the land of Mordent after surviving a shipwreck and settled in the region. The skilled bard earned his living as a musician and accepted orders to build musical instruments. One day, he received a visit from a strange gentleman who commissioned him to manufacture a bagpipe. The client would provide him with the materials, and the bar should not ask questions. Stewart began the construction of the bagpipe, but was surprised to receive human skin for the bagpipe, instead of animal leather, and elven bones for the tubes. The bard promptly refused these materials, but was threatened by the angry client, and fearing for his life, he finished the project. When the bagpipes were finally ready, the mysterious stranger came to collect his macabre order, and the bard hastened to get rid of the instrument. Before paying for the order, the stranger insisted on testing the instrument, and began a song that emitted terrible sounds. In desperation, the bard begged the stranger to stop, but he continued with the music until the bard died and had his soul drawn into the bagpipe, finally completing the cursed item. The Pipe of Morden has many powers, and those who know its secret songs can use them to cause havoc. The melody of madness sends listeners into a state of rage, the dance macabre can animate the dead, and the symphony of souls can consume spirits into the bagpipe and allow the user to summon them to serve him at will. Legends say 
that only the tears of a banshee can destroy this artifact. Its current whereabouts are unknown, and some believe that agents of the Kargat took it to the Black Vault of Azalin. The people of Morden have great pride and affection for their dogs, and these animals are welcome even inside taverns. Several aristocratic families have huge mastiffs in their crests, and these animals have also populated the folklore of the region. It is said that Spelaka, a recluse arcane from this region, created a spell to animate dead hounds as skeletal guardians to serve her even after death. There is also many rumors of ghostly hounds guarding the master mansions even after death. However, the most feared canine hauntings are the fen hounds, monstrous animals that appear under the full moonlight. It is said that these dogs are manifestations of spirits of revenge against those who commit serious crimes, and that they can sniff out those who have their souls corrupted and failed tests of power. For almost a century, these animals were a common fear for the population that lived near the Great Moor. The Fen Hounds existed to avenge the curse that befell the Westcote family, after Bertrand Westcote sent his hound to chase the bride Anna, who fled into the swamps. Anna murdered Burton's brother and decided to flee into the swamps. The escape resulted in the death of both Anna and the pursuing hounds, drowning in the mud, but not before casting a terrible curse in the Westcott family. The once thriving city of Stadwall now lies abandoned and in ruins. Those who wander through its abandoned structures still find on its banks an old ferryman willing to take people across the Arden River. This ferryman is eager to tell his passengers about the possible riches that must be kept inside the mansion of the deceased Holloway family, encouraging people to investigate the haunted mansion. He is a cursed man an assassin who has plagued Stadwall for centuries. His name is Smite, and he greedily desired the riches that the aristocratic Holloway family possessed. One misty night, while he was leading the Holloway's son and heir and his bride, he gave in to his greed and murdered the couple to take their riches. His macabre act in the middle of the river attracted the attention of the ghostly ferryman, a supernatural entity drowned to death. Fearing that he too was doomed, he made a pact with the ghostly ferryman. He would lure victims to the ghostly ferryman and sacrifice them in his name. In return, he would one day own all the Holloway riches. Only when all the gold that had once belonged to the Holloways was his, he would be free of his services. Unable to distance himself from the shores of the river, Smite proceeded to murder the Holloway family members and others who crossed the river in his vessel. The constant murders brought panic to the city of Stadwall, which was abandoned by the population. The Holloways were eliminated over the years, and the last members of the family hid in the seclusion of their manor, until they withered away and disappeared. To this day, the ferryman continues his murdering services. He will only be free when he possesses all the Holloway wealth, but he is prevented from leaving the banks of the river. He then urges his passengers to seek the riches of the Holloway's haunted mansion, only to murder them on their return journey, taking the wealth he believes is his rightful claim. Another mystery plaguing the disappearance of aristocrats encompasses the Scott Matter family, who were imprisoned within a painting after meeting with a mysterious nobleman, Lord Sittington Grey. Lord Sittington is a member of the court of the Shadow Fae, who 
who had created his secret abode in the region of the Grey Heathlands. The painter, Margaret Scott Matter, was known for her beautiful landscape paintings, and in one of her works, she accidentally painted the secret entrance to this fey lord lair. Assuming the false identity of Lord Sittington, he corresponded with the Scott Matter painters until he was formally invited to their home, where he used his magic to imprison the family within their paintings. Margaret tried to escape this fate by committing suicide before Lord Sittington had completed his spell, but her spirit became trapped in her paintings. Lord Sittington took with him the painting depicting the entrance to his secret lair. It is said that Margaret's spirits wandered through her paintings in her gallery, and that some nights her spectral image can be seen in the locations she painted, desperately crying for help. The haunted lands of Morden prove to us that not only by restless spirits can a manor become haunted. The Lumley family gained renown for the remarkable inventor, Howard Lumley. He was known for his automaton inventions, and his home was filled with his ingenuity, with elevators, moving stairs, aqueducts, and pipes of hot water, steam instruments, and assorted mechanical marvels. His greatest creation, of which he was most proud, was the Automatic Man, an automaton that mimicked a human body, with a metal frame and a face made of porcelain. This automaton acted as the inventor's steward and servant, and such was the attention and care devoted to the Automatic Man by his creator, that he became to develop a conscience. One day, however, without warning, the Automatic Man went mad and escaped from the mansion in a murderous rage. After committing several murders, he was chased by the population and fled back to the mansion. Despite his creator's protests, the mob invaded the house. The automatic man fought for his life, killing several of his attackers, and even his own creator. In the end, however, it was destroyed. It became a pile of rubble. The Lumley Manor was abandoned, and most of the population considers the place to be haunted by the spirits of those who die in these confrontations. That same year, the region was hit by a terrible storm. Part of the Lumley Mansion collapsed, and the basement was flooded. The water somehow carried the conscience from the wreckage of the automatic man to the entire house. Today. The heirs of this property hesitate to occupy it, and it is said that these strange mechanisms seem to work on their own, as if commanded by a vengeful and evil conscience. The automatic man now occupies the entire Lumley mansion, which is haunted by the will of this mechanical golem. Another example of the dangers of those who get carried away by their scientific minds and obsessions can be found in the Ramsey family. Blake Ramsey was a prominent modern figure. A powerful arcane, he was also a brilliant physician, and believed he could unite these arts to advance medical surgery to another level. While he mastered the technique, he lacked ethical principles. He practiced experimental surgeries, justified by his incessant search for knowledge and development of medical technique, but these surgeries were often performed without the consent of his patients, and without the use of anesthesia. Soon his actions began to draw on the attention of the community, and he decided to move away, far from the reach of the law and the watchful eyes of his peers. He gathered his wife Helen and doctor Lisa, and sailed to a small island off the coast, where he ordered the construction of his manor. Finally, he was living in isolation and free to pursue his interests undisturbed. In addition to these scientific discoveries, 
He also wanted a male heir to carry on his legacy as a great doctor and scientist. And before long, the Ramsay family grew. Helen was pregnant with a child when she traveled. And the child was born soon after they reached the island. Gregory Blake was born with deformities and was hunchbacked and full of strange wounds all over his body. His father despised him knowing he would never have the respect of society. Two years later, he and Helen had a new son, named Blake Jr. However, this child was soon revealed to be mentally handicapped, and was similarly despised by his father. Blake blamed his wife for not being able to give him healthy children, and their relationship deteriorated. Although he initially did not consider Lisa to be his successor, Blake found himself out of options and began to devote all his efforts to educating Lisa as his successor in medical studies so that she would one day carry on his legacy. Tragedy would strike the Ramsay family. Lisa was swept away by a strong windstorm when she was just 12 years old and fell from a rocky cliff. Blake went after his doctor and found her dead body. Before the frightened eyes of his family, he took the body to his laboratory, where he remained obsessively working for 14 days. His attempts to revive the body weren't working, and he needed fresh organs, and so, one night, he finally came out of his lab and murdered his wife and two other children, in order to get the body parts he needed for the surgeries to rebuild Lisa. Just before midnight, in a stormy night, Lisa finally awoke, a flesh golem, animated by her father's obsession, but her eyes, once a deep blue, were now a sickly luminescent green. Blake tried swapping her eyes for those of other members of his family, but they soon took the same sickly green color. He then burned the remains of his wife and children in an oven to rid himself of the evidence of the murder, only to find that he would now live eternally haunted by their specters. Blake knows that with his glowing green eyes, Lisa would never be able to fulfill the role of carrying on his legacy and spread his discoveries to the world, and now he keeps her imprisoned in the basement. He believes he will soon fight some victim who has the right set of eyes to make his doctor perfect again. Unable to leave his island, he watches the stormy ocean, knowing that sooner or later the seas will bring him victims to to serve as donors for his doctor. Another curious case involving creators and craftsmen who become obsessed with their creations can be found in the remote town of Idletop. Near this city lives the recluse Leon Laurence Ponchinel, an old inventor and craftsman who in the past served in the clerical career. Once a cleric, in the service of the Brotherhood of Abundant Light, he experienced the horrors of war when he served as a healer in conflicts fought in distant lands. His fate was tested by this experience, and he turned away from religion. After reading the book Enigma Vitae, written by the brilliant scientist Victor Mordenheim, Dian became obsessed with the possibility of animating dead matter and creating life through his experiments. An experienced taxidermist, he began experiments to reanimate corpses, where he created aberrations made with different parts of human and animal bodies. He named these creatures Minkins, and their sight was a shock to the unwary. Hands that were tied to heads, headless torsos with only arms and a single eye, and other freak combinations, were created to serve him and he would insert tiny brain fragments into their bodies, so that they would have a modicum of intelligence. The existence of these creatures did not go unnoticed by the population of Idletorp, 
who decided to lynch the artificer and his creations. The violence was stopped by a group of adventurers, who prevented a massacre. However, the situation only worsened when Lin decided to use parts of an assassin's corpse for his next experiments, and the minkins created from these materials became violent creatures. Another family that had its origins in the lands of Warden, but it spread its cursed legacy throughout the lands of the mists, is the Timothy family, an aristocratic clan that helped to colonize those lands in the distant past. No one knows when this bloodline was tainted with lycanthropy, but their presence in Mordent was marked by blood and claw. The first member of this family, proven to be a natural werewolf, was Cain Timothy, born in 637 of the Barovian calendar. Cain hid his werewolf condition well and behaved as a wolf hiding in the skin of a sheep. Keeping up the facade of an aristocrat, he married his cousin, Elizabeth Timothy, and soon his family grew. The fruits of this union produced a litter of children, all natural werewolves. Elwyn, Sean, and Esther were raised by their parents to survive among society, hunting among men, but as they developed their first bestial transformation during their teenage years, Hiding this family of werewolves became increasingly difficult. Esther Timothy managed to maintain her facade as a young aristocrat and married Hector de Lisnia, joining the lineage of that family. A few years after this marriage was consummated, she gave birth to three other children, one of whom was Virginia de Lisnia, a natural werewolf who would pass on her werewolf curse to her descendants in distant lands. In the modern branch, tragedy struck the family in the year 679, when the family patriarch, King Timothy, his wife Elizabeth, and their son Sean were killed under mysterious circumstances. It is unknown whether the death in the family was the result of the confrontation with hunters, who finally uncovered the wolf clan's facade or an internal dispute over the leadership of the pack. As heir to the family possessions, and one of the strong suspects in their deaths, Elwin Timothy assumed the position of pack leader. Elwin married Emily Gerhardt, with whom he also had numerous children, but only one of them turned out to be a natural werewolf like his father. His son, Nathan, was a natural werewolf and rose to infamy in the land of the mists, becoming the Dark Lord of Arkandale, and father to Alfred Timothy, who would also become a Dark Lord of the Verbrick domain. Despite his advanced age, Elwin continued to plague the domain of Morlin, and he is now a werewolf, expert at hunting and hiding his monstrous nature. Those who venture along the trails of the lightless wood cannot deviate from their path, lest they get lost in the trickles of tangled trees. The situation is made worse by the constant rotation of the mists by the treetops, and by the rumors that the demonic forces that the cultists of the Guadamon family served still plague this region. The only option for those crossing this large wood is to seek shelter and supplies in the village of Tumbledown located in the heart of the forest. The small village has a sinister aura, and the people seem to live under constant fear and tension. Those who stay in the city for a while soon discover that the city is controlled by a council of merchants, and that the mayor is just a formal title, without any authority. No one dares to oppose the decisions of this council and many have disappeared into the swamps for daring to disagree with their orders. The true nature of the council interests and activities is a mystery, but many speculate that they are searching for Gwaldamon's ancient fortune, hidden somewhere in the woods, or maybe looking after ancient artifacts and secrets left behind by the family of demonic cultists. Aside from the city of Mordenshire, 
The only other city of note in Warden is Blackburn Crossing, where the Arden River and the Wolfen River met. The city was founded by the Blackburn and Bruce families and has a vocation to be a wider and more cosmopolitan commercial center. While it doesn't compare to large cities in other realms, the city is more open to non-human races and is more active than most of the modern communities. This vocation for commercial activities has also attracted criminals to the region, and the city is said to maintain a growing black market. In Arden Bay, however, we find the main city of the region, Mordenshire. The city spreads out along the cove, protected by the rock walls of the cliffs. The port city is always cold and wet, which is only made worse by the constant fog in the region. Those looking from the harbor into Mordent's countryside see the imposing house of the Griffon Hill, a long abandoned building reputed to be haunted. No Mordentish approached this building, whose past encompassed so many macabre stories, and even the roads leading to its entrance are already covered by vegetation. Distancing from the cove, as we climb the slopes around the bay, we reach the richest part of the city. Here we can find the Chapel of the Pure Hearts, the center of the fate of Ezra and Bastion of Mordent. Although this sect is known for its peaceful and merciful view of the fate, the Mordent sect is going through uncertain times. An old anchorite named Lacres claims to have received a prophetic vision from Ezra, warning him of a great threat. In this vision, he was warned that the sect of the founts of Nevrushar in Darkon had been infiltrated by an evil fiend, and that in the future they would lead a crusade against the sect of Mordent, massacring their followers. He was then tasked with protecting this sect. After informing his sect leaders of these revelations, they began secretly recruiting the blessed army of Ezra men-at-arms devoted to Ezra, who act as protectors. All members of this blessed army receive the revelation of Lacrae's visions and prepare for the day when he will be called upon to defend the modern sect. In this noble area of the city, we also find the headquarters of an elite force of investigators, the Lamplighters. Known for their characteristic lamps, these investigators are a select group under the command of Sheriff Owen Finhalen and trained by the experienced Sir Samuel Coase. This arm of the law selects only candidates who pass rigorous physical and mental tests, and their crime-solving and investigation skills have gained fame throughout Mordent. Now, it's not uncommon for lamplighters to be requested and exported to other towns and cities of Mordent in permanent garrisons. It is also in the noble area of Mordenshire that we find the Hitter Manor, the imposing abode of the aristocratic Weathermay family, and home to Lord Jules, the last aristocrat of Mordent and de facto leader of the nation. Also in this region, close to the cliffs, is the home of the mayor, Daniel Foxgrove. Daniel is the son-in-law of Lord Jules and was married to his daughter, Alice Weathermay, who sadly died giving birth to the twins Laurie and Jennifer Weathermay Foxgrove. Daniel Foxgrove is a tormented man and secretly serves the evil ghost of Lord Wilfred Godfrey, the ghost of the House of the Griffon Hill and Dark Lord of Morden, has enslaved Alice Weathermay's spirit and uses it to blackmail her former husband. If he obeys, he is visited one night by his wife's spirit, but if he disobeys, Alice's soul falls victim to a terrible torment at the hands of Godfrey. His doctors, Laurie and Jennifer Weathermay Foxgrove, are responsible for upholding the legacy of the famed Boston hunter Dr. Rudolf van Richten. After von Richten's disappearance, 
the twins decided to finally enter his herb shop and abode in Mordant to look for clues to his whereabouts. They have found no clues about Van Richten's fate, but they did find numerous research and unpublished material on the creatures of the night, as well as letters and correspondence with several other fellow researchers of the supernatural and monster hunters. Based on these correspondences, the sisters started the Van Richten Society, a secret group of allies in the fight against the forces of darkness, we communicate through the exchange of correspondence. Through this network of allies, they join forces and knowledge as they try to keep Dr. Rudolf van Richten's legacy alive. Our contact with the spirits proves a frightening and disturbing experience. The dead speak to us, first through the message board, and then begin to manifest their presence among us. Many horrible secrets are revealed, but nothing is discovered about the Van Richten's whereabouts. The old hunter must be alive, or maybe his spirit may be imprisoned, beyond the reach of the knowledge of the dead. We are relieved to hear that the natural werewolf that infected us in Velbra is already dead. Whether by the spells we unleashed in our escape, or by some other savage confrontation in those lands, our path to the cure of lycanthropy may finally begin. There is no time to celebrate the news, however. Suddenly, we feel the air grow cold, and the spirits themselves seem to become fearful of the arrival of some unholy force. The medium, Michael Jandalis, seems to fear the approaching presence, and tries to end the seance, but we soon notice the presence of a ghostly figure with an aristocratic appearance and a cruel look in his eyes. How dare you question the experience of the world? Your insolence and curiosity deserve to be punished. With a macabre touch, this ghost's heavy hand touches our head, and we scream in pain and fear as our consciousness is taken over by an evil presence. Join us, subscribe to this channel, and turn on notifications, and together we will confront the truth about the terrible Lord Wilfred Godfrey, the Dark Lord of Morden.